Amen, amen, and amen. Turn to your neighbor and tell, ask them, are you glad you came today? The Spirit has already been at work, obviously moved by Caesar's baptism, moved by Deji's baptism. You may not have been able to hear, but that third baptism uh, was from our good friends at Grace Chinese Baptist Church. Many of them are up here. Uh, wave at us there. We're so glad that Pastor Nora is here with their congregation and Pastor Peter was doing the baptism. Uh, I got to visit with Mrs. Lee right before Clifford's baptism. And she told me they've been praying for his baptism for 44 years. It's an answer of prayer. Amen. She was in tears, I was in tears. There were a lot of tears right here at the front of the sanctuary. It's interesting on that Easter Sunday so long ago, it also started with tears, but not tears of joy. We read earlier the first nine verses there of John chapter 20. We pick up the story in verse 11. It says, now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. And as she wept, she bent to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. And they asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken away my Lord, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you are looking for? Thinking it was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. She turned, uh, Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned to him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus said, do not hold on to me for I have not yet ascended to the father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God, and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. And she told them that, she, that he had said these things to her. Father, we pray today that the words of my mouth, and the meditation of each of our hearts would be pleasing in your sight. O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Why are you weeping? That's really what they asked her there in the darkness of that pre-dawn moment. In between her own sobs, all she could get out were the bare facts. They have taken my Lord and I don't know where they have put him. But I imagine that if we could peer into Mary Magdalene's heart that morning, if we could look into the depths of her soul, we would know that it was more than the, the bare facts that was causing her deep grief that morning. When we read through the scriptures, especially in Luke's gospel, we learn that Mary Magdalene was a woman who for much of her life had suffered under severe demon possession. She was a woman who was well acquainted with the darkness. Now, in our modern world, we don't talk a lot about demon possession, and I'm not going to begin to jump in uh, to that can of worms today, but I do know that she was someone who suffered severely. When we read the text, we, we can have some affinities to people who suffer today with things that we just don't understand and don't know what to do anything about. In the Bible, it's interesting. No one who is de demon possessed is ever blamed for their own demon possession, at least not by Jesus. When Jesus comes to those who are demon possessed, he sees not somebody who has done something wrong to deserve that, but someone who is suffering under the brokenness of this world. Mary Magdalene had suffered mightily. Luke gives us a tidbit that says that when she was rescued, she was rescued from the fact that she was possessed by seven demons. Now, again, because we don't live in that world, we don't recognize what that might indicate. Uh, one demon, seven demons, it all sounds bad to us, and it was. But in their world, they, they really be believed that, that demon possession was something that started off slow. You could be possessed by one demon, but to be possessed by seven demons really represented a life that had seen a cycle of possession, of, of being possessed, of suffering mightily, of perhaps having a season of healing, a, a time when things got better, only to be plunged ever deeper into darkness. We know this because Jesus taught on the subject in Luke chapter 11, and he said, when an impure spirit comes out of a person, and it goes through arid places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to the house I left. 
And when it arrives, it finds the house swept clean and put in order. And then it goes and takes seven other spirits more wicked than itself, and they go in and live there. And the final condition of that person is worse than the first. This is really a description of Mary Magdalene's life before she met Jesus. Hers was a life so racked by suffering that neither she nor her family nor her friends knew how to bring her any relief. And my guess is that compiled her troubles because just like in our world, when someone suffers in ways that seem beyond our comprehension, we don't always know what to do with it. And because of that, we often will pull back, afraid somehow of the darkness that has enveloped their lives. I remember attending a funeral of a friend who suffered from really severe mental illnesses. He'd not always been that way. It really struck him in his 20s and really decimated his life. We would have lunch every now and then and, and, and his life had just fallen apart on so many levels until he died tragically in his late 20s. At the service, they did an open mic, which I'm just telling you, if, we ever, if I'm ever conducting a funeral, I will do an open mic, but it always makes me nervous. And this service is one of the reasons why. At first, people got up to talk about Brian, and all they talked about were the days of his early life, his childhood, his teenage years. They told stories of all the good memories they have, which, which is what we do. And it was good, and, and it was honoring his life, and, and it was the way funerals are meant to be, except that it really felt like we were ignoring such a large part of his life. You could have attended that funeral and never known the suffering that Brian had encountered until the last person got up to share her thoughts. And for really what felt like, I mean, it probably was only five minutes, but it felt like 30. Brian's ex-wife stood up and in just vivid, harsh detail described all the pain and suffering his illness had brought on her and her children. I was not the pastor in charge of that service, praise the Lord. In fact, I was just there as a friend. I was sitting on the back row and yet I could see people fidgeting. Again, I wasn't in charge, but I was sweating like the pastor in charge. I was like, how do we get out of this situation? It was so uncomfortable. And as I've thought about that over the years, I've realized that's what we do with the darkness we don't understand, isn't it? We either try to ignore it or we shout at it, but neither really seems to help, does it? And that brings us to our knees and causes us to weep sometimes, doesn't it? Like Mary in that garden so long ago. Why are you weeping? It's not just because Jesus was dead, though that was a big part of it. It's probably also because of all she feared that would happen to her now that he was dead. I wonder if she remembered his teaching that the last condition of a person is worse than the first. I wonder if she had thought back to how troubled her life was before she met Jesus and now feared the worst. What would happen now that he was gone? You see, for a while, she had believed that she had really permanently, finally been healed. We don't, aren't really told the story of how she interacts and meets Jesus in this way or the actual story of her healing, but somehow Jesus has spoken a word over her and the darkness in her life was dispelled. So that wherever she went with Jesus, there was a lightness to her soul. The scriptures help us understand she was one of the early leaders of the church, the gathered church. She played a prominent role in Jesus's ministry where the rest of the world had excluded her and shamed her and cut her down. In Jesus, she had found one who loved her as she was and in that love made her better than she ever thought that she could be. Imagine when she was sitting there listening to his teacher and he said things like, I am the light of the world. Her beam, her light, her face beamed with that light because she had found it to be true in her day-to-day -day living. How much more it would have seemed then to be plunged into that darkness when the light that she had known in Christ was taken away as he was crucified on the cross. Why are you weeping? I think she was weeping because she was fearful that the darkness was on its way back. And if seven demons could replace the one, would 70 times seven now place the seven who had gone before? Have you ever experienced 
a despair like that? A darkness that seems even more dark because you've had a glimpse of the light? We human beings are really resilient people, aren't we? Uh, we can endure many things, but, but nothing can cause despair in our soul like someone throwing water on hope recently rekindled. We thought that we had the cancer beat, but now they've told us it's back. We thought we had the job, but now they've given it to someone else. We thought we were living in sobriety, but after six months of living clean, we now have fallen off the wagon. There are so many different ways in this life we have experienced partial healings only to find ourselves plunged ever deeper into the darkness. Even we believers gathered on Easter morning can have moments like that. This morning we gather and we celebrate, rightly so, but I'm not gonna ask for a show of hands how many of you have had dark days between this Easter and the last. Dark days where you looked out at the brokenness of the world, the brokenness of your own soul, and you really wondered whether it was the darkness that was gonna win after all. Sometimes for Christians, that despair can even be more deep. Uh, we can experience it more deeply than others because like Mary Magdalene, we have had seasons when we have felt the healing touch of Christ. And it only makes the darkness that much darker. It's like when you get up in the night. Have you ever done this? You get up in the night and you go get a drink of water. Uh, you know, I've learned in life, you just don't turn lights on at night. That's not a good idea. You make your way to the refrigerator and you want a glass of water, and, and at my house this works, you know, you've been asleep for a few hours, so your pupils are wide open. You are adjusted to the darkness. You can't see well, but you can see enough, enough to manage your way to the refrigerator. But our refrigerator, hey, I don't know why they did it this way, but they have the water on the inside of the door to this refrigerator. So if you want a cup of water in the middle of the night, you have no choice but to open the door and be blinded by the light. Hmm? And that's really not, it's unpleasant when you open the door and the light shines in, but that's not really where the real danger happens. I mean, if you open the light, your, your light comes on, your pupils go tight and, and you get the water, it's when you close the door. For while on the way to the refrigerator, you were someone who was managing in the darkness, on the way back, you are walking blind. That's what happens when we get a glimpse of the light and then once again encounter the darkness of our days. My friends, that's where we live as believers. We've experienced the touch of Jesus. We've experienced his healing. We've experienced days of great joy when we've known his presence in the most intimate of ways. We've gotten to witness that today. This is one of those days where we hear the voice of God and we experience the light of his face. But there are other days, aren't there? Days when trouble comes our ways, days when we get phone calls we never want to get, days when, when really we, we watch the news and we just, we feel like we might despair just from what's happened today, not just mention, to mention all of our days. We look at the depths of our own hearts and discover a darkness there sometimes that just doesn't seem to go away. And because we've known a little bit of the light, we find ourselves falling ever deeper into darkness. We should know better. We should know better. But I think we just can't help ourselves. Jesus told us in this life, you will have trouble. But we don't always believe it, do we? We look at, we live in this world in such a way and we wonder, is the darkness actually winning? Some people tell us it's inevitable, right? Right? I mean, there's all sorts of folks that tell us out there that all of our thinking about God is wishful thinking. It's, it's just hoping that there's more to this life than what we can see with our eyes, but that if we were really paying attention, we would know that the darkness is all there really is, all that's really on its way. I was reading a science article about, by, by John Hogan, a science journalist, and he's really talking about how even scientists have this yearning for life to last forever so that even even, of those, even those of them who do not have faith still postulate hypotheses about whether or not black holes somehow contain all the information that has ever happened so that we could somehow say the universe knows our name, that somehow we are remembered in the depths of a black hole. You, you can look up the article, John uh, 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 Horgan. It's about, does the universe remember your name? 
And he goes through all of these hypotheses and really at the end accuses all of these science of falling for the same thing that the religious fall for, this desire to live forever. But he says, look, our works of science, mathematics, philosophy, art, music, and yes, even my journalism will one day slip back into the void from whence they came. Everything we have thought and done will be for naught. That's what the world believes. And yet, he admits, even with his own soul, there is a yearning for more. He concludes that article by saying, and yet still here I am, scribbling in my notebooks. Well, which is it? Which is it, are we people who are just scribbling in notebooks in vanity against the darkness, or are we a people who have a reason for our hope? What is it that we are looking for? Just this blessed idea that we somehow might live forever, or is there real evidence? I think really go back to the garden there with weeping Mary Magdalene. If anybody had no reason for wishful thinking, it was her. Mary Magdalene is not a person who in that moment is in a position to make up good news. She is feeling the depths of the sorrows of this planet in the very core of her soul. She weeps because she is there where many of us sometimes find ourselves, facing the void and wondering, is this all there is? And her story changes not because she has a good idea, but rather because someone spoke her name. Not someone else who is struggling the same sorts of troubles, but someone who had gone into the depths of the darkness of this universe and come out the other side alive. We read in the text, there is another man there that day who asked her, Woman, it's a term of endearment in that language. It doesn't sound that way to us, but we might say, dear woman, why are you weeping? Who is it that you look for? And she thinks this is the gardener. She thinks this is someone who simply overheard the conversation they've already had. She, she just says, look, I don't know what they've done with him. If you've put in somewhere, tell me so that I may go and grieve, that I may go pay my respects and do the little that we can do in this life. She's still in the depths of sorrow when it tells us the living Lord. Can we say that? The living Lord spoke her name. Why do we believe? Not because we hope someone's out there, but because the one who is has come looking for us and called our names. Friends, we live still in dark days. We live in days where the brokenness of this life still remains. Jesus' death and resurrection was an invasion uh, into this world. It's brought the ultimate victory, but it's a victory that we will see worked out over time until Christ comes again. So we should expect in Jesus' own teaching, there are gonna be dark days. There are gonna be troubles. There are gonna be moments where we weep in the darkness, but friends, we need need not grieve as those who have no hope because they're in the darkness with us. What did the text start out? There on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, God rolled away the stone. And Jesus walked out of the grave. We can know it because he is a living Lord. He's not just an idea. He's not a concept. He's not just a figure in history. He is a living Lord. Through the power of his spirit, he still says our names. I need that message, friends. I need that message because we look out into the world and it is so filled with darkness, so filled with trouble that I don't know about you, but there are moments where I just feel like Mary. All I can do is weep. I don't have answers to the world's problems. Can you just, can you just say that out loud? I know there are a lot of people, preachers who get on Twitter and they have all sorts of good advice for all sorts of things. Uh, you know, they, they go on news shows and all those things. I, I don't have answers for all the world's problem, but I do have hope because there is one who is alive, who I believe has called my name. And we gather to worship each and every Sunday because we know we need to keep hearing the living Lord speak our names. 
We need to keep hearing the living Lord call us out of his love. We need to keep hearing the living Lord speak to us. Friends, we are not at the end of the story yet. But the one who will bring the end has already come. And he loves us and he knows us by name and he calls us to join him in a journey of faith so that we might live even in dark days with the light of the Lord. One of the things I love about the Easter story is that the resurrection had already happened even though nobody really knew it. See, when we're so accustomed to living in the darkness, when we're blinded by the darkness in our day-to-day lives, we don't always see well, do we? Story tells us Mary, she goes to the tomb early. She goes into the tomb and she's the one who goes into the tomb. And I don't know if the angels were already sitting there or they show up later, but, but she misses some key things, right? She, she misses that, that the grave clothes, that they aren't just scattered about, they're actually neatly folded up. She, she misses that grave robbers wouldn't do that, but that's the way it is when our eyes are blinded by the darkness. We don't see everything accurately, but I've got good news for you this Easter. Just because you don't see something well, just because you don't feel it uh, very well, doesn't mean it isn't real. That even though she didn't see the evidence, truth was Jesus was already alive. And that had changed everything. And so I don't know how you came in this morning. I don't know what troubles and sorrows have filled your heart, but I do know there's one who calls your name. He's the same one who's called Caesar. He's the same one who's called Deja. He's the same one who's called Clifford, and he calls you. Do you hear his name? He invites us to listen with with ears of faith. I know we're 2,000 years removed. We don't get to experience this in the same way that Mary experienced it, but that same Jesus is still alive. And he loves you more than you can imagine. And he invites us with Mary to hear our names and to respond in faith so that we might leave this place. And when people ask, what did you do on Easter? We can say with her, I saw the Lord. We can live our lives new. Mary helped change the world. She was the first proclaimer of the resurrection and the world was never the same. Let's do as she and go forth from this place and live with hope even in the darkness because we know we have heard our voice, or heard our names and seen the Lord. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Lord, we give you thanks that you love us so much that you have overcome the grave and you have called us by name that we might know you, the one true God, the living Lord. And it can change everything about our lives and someday the whole universe. For Lord, we we don't actually believe that the darkness gets the last say but because of your resurrection from the grave, that Lord, the goodness of this life, it's it's not a small flame waiting to be extinguished by an everlasting darkness, but rather the evil of this life, no matter how severe is that which is slipping away one day to be pushed away forever by your glorious light. Lord, help us to be a people who live in hope and faith and trust that you are indeed the light of the world, that you're alive and that we can put our faith in you. Lord, I pray this morning that if there's someone here who's never put their faith in you, Lord, they've, they've, they've waffled through the years of really what it means to, to give themselves to you, that they would not wait another day. What testimonies they have seen today. You, you're never too old. You're never too young. You're, you're never too far gone to hear Jesus calling your name responding in faith. Lord, we pray today that you'd move in this place, that once again we might hear your voice and see with eyes of faith, you are alive. Pray this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.